Hello everyone. This is the first video lecture of the week, um, and I, uh, as I promised last week, uh, we're investigating the beginnings of archaeology, uh, archaeological exploration in the Middle East, um, and the general sort of discovery of ancient Near Eastern culture um, and the history of archaeological practice, uh, mostly focusing on the 19th century. Um, this is a very interesting history for us uh, to be involved in uh, because the way we understand ancient Near Eastern cultures today, the way we study the methods that we use um, to study them is very much uh, influenced and built by uh, this history of 19th century um, archaeology that started in the Middle East. Um, and um, during the 19th century, much of many of the sort of uh, geographic areas that we're looking at in this class um, was under the control of the Ottoman Empire, um, which was gradually weakening at this time, leading uh, to its collapse uh, in the 1920s and the establishment of the modern Turkish Republic to replace it. Um, and this is also the 19th century is the time when European and American powers are competing to gain control of this landscape um, as the Ottoman territories gradually diminish. Um, this is also the time then of colonialism and uh, the expansion of colonial powers. Um, and really dynamic uh, geopolitics of territoriality in the Middle East. It's also the time of Orientalism um, when this imaginary idea of the Orient, uh, the East, as a visual, uh, literary, and architectural system of representation uh, was fully materialized. Therefore, the art and archaeology of the Middle East uh, that we're studying in this class um, is very much the product of this episode of history. Um, Mesopotamia, Syria, Anatolia, the Levantine coast, uh, Iran. Um, this is the history of the ancient world we're looking at. Um, and this history, as we understand it today, is very much entangled with the 19th and 20th century uh, historiography that, that emerges um, um, out of these, um, these practices. Um, last week, we spoke about the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago as an imperial museum, as an institution that links Chicago, the history of Chicago, to the study of Near Eastern uh, cultures and societies. Oriental Institute was um, established uh, by uh, John Henry Breasted in 1919 as a center uh, for research, uh, archaeological fieldwork, archaeological field projects, an archive as well as a museum. Um, in the third lecture of this week, I will return to the Oriental Institute um, at the end to discuss the importance of such research institutions um, in the study of the ancient Middle East. Um, upon the foundation of the Institute, uh, James uh, Breasted commissioned a very interesting relief panel as the tympanum over its ent uh, entrance and designed uh, by Breasted himself and sculpted by Ulrich Ellerhausen. In this fascinating scene, the personification of the East, um, uh, an ancient Egyptian scribe, hands over a wolf fragment uh, with an inscription from the fifth century dynasty temple um, to the personification of the West, this semi-nude classical person, uh, meaning to represent the Eastern origin of uh, writing systems. Behind each of these figures, we see that the whole scene is divided into two halves, um, two um, the Eastern civilizations represented on the left um, and Western civilizations on the right. Uh, dividing up the global history to this kind of sharp east-west divide. 
Um, uh, East taken here is the role of ancient wisdom, while the West is, uh, take, takes on the role, role of uh, the future progress and modernity. Uh, notable with, um, with the buildings and pers per persons that are represented in each side, um, with the uh, uh, sort of Assyrian lion, the Eastern lion uh, versus the Western bison. Um, and um, you should note that the archeologist with his little pot that he's holding is included in the Western sphere. Um, so you see the archaeology actually is mobilized to build a specific vision of the world, uh, a specific map of the world in the way that uh, James Prestead has imagined it, or would like to imagine it. Um, and I will suggest in various times in this class that, um, that archaeology and cultural heritage um, are always political, they're always uh, contested, and they easily become tools of political uh, political propaganda, the apparatus of political discourse in the public sphere. Um, imagine the role of um, uh, classical Athens' Parthenon, for example, the, the role it plays in the contemporary politics. Um, I'm showing you also in the middle um, an image of the Bamiyan Valley in Afghanistan where Rakat Buddha images um, were exposed were dynamited by the Taliban regime in 2001. And on the right, I'm, show you, uh, I'm showing you Islamic State militants hammering Assyrian wall reliefs and sculpture um, in 2014 and 15. These are very contentious, very vivid examples of um, this contestation of cultural heritage in the Middle East. Let's have an overview of the objectives of this week, um, which roughly corresponds to the three lectures that I will present to you. The first objective is to explore the historical context of archaeological exploration of the Middle East um, under the Ottoman Empire uh, by the colonial powers. We will discuss this uh, colon colonialism and um, Orientalism and ask the questions, what is colonialism and what is uh, Orientalism, to articulate uh, this geopolitics of the geopolitics of the region. Um, secondly, we will um, look more closely to the early explorations of the Middle East, such as uh, Napoleon Bonaparte's uh, scientific expedition to Egypt uh, between 1799 and 1802, um, and um, a series of uh, excavation of a series of Assyrian sites in the Mosul province of the Ottoman Empire, uh, such as uh, Nimrud and Nineveh. And, in, and the third objective um, is to look at the idea of the Imperial Museum. Um, a lot of uh, the sculpture, the buildings, the artifacts that were excavated during those excavations in the 19th century um, in um, Iraq, in Syria, in Turkey, were shipped to Western museums and met uh, European and American audiences for the first time. Um, and these audiences were trained in classical sculpture, in classical art, and we're going to discuss how they were received uh, and, um, and understood and curated in these kind of museum contexts. Archaeology in the context of the 19th century uh, colonialism was first and foremost considered to be a way of systematically knowing these colonized lands, landscapes, um, the surveying of the land, mapping, uh, studying its antiquities and its ruins. Um, this is one of the, uh, the sort of um, the first major function of archaeology as we understand it in the context of the of the 19th century. Um, secondly. Um, it also served as a, for, as a way, as a method of acquiring objects for Western museums and supplying them with splendid collections that they have today, uh, which in a way built also uh, an image of, the, of their empire uh, within the museum 
an exhibition hall. Um, you can see that really easily if you visit the uh, Oriental Institute Museum, uh, one of those imperial museums, um, uh, uh, and, and, and see Near Eastern artifacts there presented as, um, as really the image of the empire. Thirdly, um, archaeology served as the religious function of discovery of cities, places, empires, um, and states mentioned in biblical texts. Um, it was largely mobilized to make Bible concrete and readily acceptable and legitimized uh, by the dis archaeological discovery of biblical places. This link between biblical references and excavated ruins in Mesopotamia was very, very crucial for the European claim um, for Mesopotamian uh, heritage um, as, um, as their ancestors. Uh, and fourth, uh, finally, archaeology played this very peculiar role as part of a package of, uh, of this kind of industrialist, mercantile, and diplomatic interventions um, into, um, into the Middle East, employing uh, technologies and scientific methodologies um, in colonial lands. Uh, for example, the construction of Berlin, Baghdad, Railway, for example, um, was very much um, uh, also a, an archaeological ex, uh, exploration uh, in a way. So whenever, wherever that railroad passed, um, the, the engineers, the scientists who were involved in this construction project um, also documented and explored and excavated archaeological sites. So let's ask this question of what is Orientalism, right? It's um, basically an episode in the Western humanistic thought, um, an episode in, um, a, and characterized clearly uh, in Edward Said's uh, book, Orientalism. Um, we could say that it is a set of representations of the East in literary, uh, artist, artistic, uh, architectural um, works of art, um, and very particularly um, a, a kind of a political discourse about the East. This, of course, comes out of a particular encounter, a real experience of the East, rather than um, uh, completely based on uh, fantasy, um, um, as it had been originally proposed. Hence, the idea of the travel to the East, um, uh, that's something that, that all wealthy young male Westerners thought about, um, it was, uh, is, was really coupled with this kind of romanticism and classicism um, that was associated with the 19th century. In these narratives, in Orientalist art and novels and buildings designed, um, the East appears as an exotic, sensual, colorful, but at the same time decaying, often violent place of inertia and laziness. Uh, we see this ridiculous excess of uh, sexuality and eroticism uh, imposed on the East, um, and um, the Near Eastern rulers are depicted as despots, and despotism is uh, understood as the kind of main political tendency associated with Near Eastern rulers for some reason. Um, we need, therefore, to understand Orientalism as an aspect of the European imperialist project uh, in the 19th century. Um, if we look at one of the most famous uh, examples of Orientalist paintings, uh, Jean-Léon uh, Jérôme's um, painting from 1870, uh, The Snake Charmer, um, all of these themes that I mentioned really become beautifully uh, visible. Um, here is an idle group of Middle Eastern individuals, supposedly, watching a snake charmer who is a nude boy, um, a completely unrealistic situation that would not at all occur. Um, but we, when we look at the architecture, 
Um, we see wall decorations that are colorful, it's kind of beautiful um, sort of glazed tiles uh, with decorations on them, very striking. But at the same time, they're age old and they're falling apart, they're decaying. Uh, parts of the tiles are falling down. Um, so, um, so sexual access um, and um, exotic architecture, laziness and decay um, are all good features that are um, used in the representation of the East. Uh, Middle Eastern communities are never depicted doing any intellectual work, any, any, any real work really, they're all um, always uh, involved in acts of uh, uh, leisureness and, and laziness. If you look at other paint, another painting by Jerome, um, uh, this also becomes very obvious. Jerome actually traveled in the Middle East, in North Africa. Um, he supposedly visited sites that he depicted. He came back with um, lots of sketches and, um, and, and drafts of some of the paintings. Um, but uh, but these paintings are sort of mostly shaped by his masculine fantasies. He traveled in Egypt, Syria, Algeria, and Turkey, and returned uh, to Paris with the sketches that he had prepared. The deceptively meticulous and polished, uh, but very precise depiction uh, of spaces and um, human situations that he creates creates an illusion of realism that actually um, turns his own fantasies, his masculine fantasies, into representations of the East. This painting speaks to the sort of uh, nude Circassian bather and uh, her African attendant uh, with a kind of, with abundant jewelry, um, uh, sort of subjugated female bodies in their racial differences uh, becomes this, uh, becomes mobilized for the um, uh, for this effect of the real uh, as well. As um, uh, I also want to point out, uh, this kind of Orientalism was not rim limited to oil painting, um, uh, and not just um, sort of straightforward art, but also in the material culture of imperial families at this time. I'm showing you the famous automatic Turk. Um, the chess playing automaton that was constructed by Hungarian Baron Wolfgang von Kempelen to impress the Empress Maria Theresa uh, in 1769. This chess playing automaton was importantly dressed and portrayed as an, as an Ottoman magician. Um, I really love this automatic Turk, having grown up in Turkey and, and sort of really um, sort of um, seeing this, this kind of Orientalism of this, um, of this automaton. Interestingly, this, um, uh, this powerful outlook gave the automatic Turk um, a kind of a long career uh, as a chess player, uh, beating important chess players of his time, um, including uh, people like Benjamin Franklin and uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, apparently. Um, one of the bi powerful biblical stories, um, of course, is the construction of the Tower of Babel, uh, symbolizing the hubris of main mankind to build a tower that reached the heavens, as we know from the book of Genesis. Uh, as you may recall, um, God punishes them by confusing their tongues. Um, in this way, the story really beautifully uh, locates the origins of multilinguality in Babylon in, the his, in this very particular historical context. In Peter Bruegel's uh, The Elder's Painting, we see the construction of the site um, of the tower um, and a Babylonian king inspecting the project on the lower left of the painting um, we also see at the same time the tower is also decaying and falling down. This is a really interesting paradox that we see. Um, it's actually a construction project of, a, of the Tower of Babel. Um, we see stone masons working on the blocks on the lower left. But because uh, this is an Orientalist painting, it also has to depict the tower to be falling down. So. Um, 
it's a really beautiful, beautiful paradox uh, embodied within this um, representation. Um, I'd like to wrap up my lecture by uh, showing you a number of photographs from the Armenian-Iranian photographer Antoine Sevriguin, who lived between 1840 and 1933. Um, not all Orientalisms are actually really directed from the west to towards with a gaze to the east uh, but sometimes the authors of those orientalisms actually come from the east uh, and Antoine Severguin's case is a really fascinating example of that his uh, glass plate negatives uh, were uh, discovered in recent years following his death um, and were confronted by an immense archive of images that he produced in late 19th and early 20th century uh, in his home country in Iran. He studied uh, painting and photography in Europe um, and returned to Iran uh, and he took not only ethnographic photographs, um, uh, especially uh, in traditional and rural communities, uh, but he also extensively documented ancient ruins, um, including several photographs uh, from uh, Persepolis, for example, um, as well as um, Islamic and medieval architectural monuments um, and um, ancient rock uh, inscriptions. Um, and the case of Antoine Sevriguin actually shows us that Orientalism is not a unidirectional movement, but one uh, can find alternative Orientalisms um, at work with artists born and raised in the East, yet educated in the West. Today, um, scholars, um, art historians continue to, um, to debate uh, uh, about Orientalism as a complex episode of, uh, of encounters, representations, fantasies, and narratives about the East. In the next lecture, uh, we will see how uh, these kind of ar archaeological illustrations actually uh, participated in this uh, particular language um, as well. Um, archaeological in, uh, illustrations that are produced by uh, archaeologists, uh, diplomats, archaeology enthusiasts who were excavating in the Middle East, particularly in Iraq. Thank you.